The end of chapter 29 is all about inheritance. Now this really should be review from bio 1111, but I'm sure some of you don't remember all of this, right? So this is our kind of quick refresher on how some of these um, inheritance patterns work and just some of the terminology surrounding this. Now, again, your future may land you in a role where this is a big part of your job, right? Talking with folks about genetic inheritance, um, maybe helping them understand risks um, associated with having offspring or their risks of having certain disease. Um, and for some of you, you're thinking this doesn't really apply to what I want to do, but maybe just in your life, right? Maybe you'll want to understand your risk at some point. So anyway, um, when Let's run through a little bit of terminology. So they give us this map um, of the chromosomes in the body, and we've been just kind of using this term, so I'm assuming you already are pretty comfortable, right? Um, what we see are 23 pairs of chromosomes in the human body. Here, the 23rd chromosome, uh, this is a male, because they have X and Y. So the 23rd chromosome is the sex chromosome. Now, what are these chromosomes made of? Do you remember that? You said DNA, that was good. DNA wound around proteins, right? This is a way that we can take meters worth of genetic code and condense it down so that it fits um, in the nucleus. Now, the only time the chromosomes are really visible is when a cell is getting ready to undergo or is undergoing um, mitosis, but that DNA is always there, right? The DNA is the code for how to build every protein in your body. And hopefully, over the course of this year of anatomy, you've realized that most things in your body are in fact protein, okay? So as we look at chromosomes, right, um, we'll talk sometimes, you might hear the term locus or loci. They're referring to very specific locations on a chromosome where a specific gene is located, right? The gene is the segment of that DNA code that actually houses the instructions for that specific protein. Um, so this is looking a lot at maybe, um, you might think of this as looking at someone's genotype, right? So the genes that they have, Right? And typically when we start thinking about the inheritance at very specific genes, we'll look at whether the copy of the gene, there are two copies, whether each of those copies is dominant or recessive. Do we remember that? So for example, right, someone might be what we call homozygous dominant. Right? Homo meaning same. So same, they have the same version of the gene, the same allele. Right? Do you remember that term? The allele is just the version of the gene, right? So in this case, they have two copies of the dominant gene. An individual who is heterozygous has two different versions, two different um, alleles. And then you can also have homozygous recessive. Those are all those are all potential genotypes. Now, if we're working with an inheritance pattern of complete dominance, what we mean there is just if the person has one copy of the dominant trait, so either two of these genotypes gives us the phenotype. Right, the genotype leads to the phenotype, the expressed, um, the traits that are actually expressed in an individual. And if we're in a case of complete dominance, any of these two patterns, as long as we have one copy of the dominant gene, it will in fact show up in the phenotype. You have to be homozygous recessive, right, in order for the recessive trait um, to show up in your phenotype. Right? So again, alleles, different versions of these genes. Now, thinking, talking about dominance, right? I kind of want just a blank screen. 
we'll use that for now. Um, thinking about dominance, that. again, I mentioned complete dominance. This is the typical pattern of inheritance you probably talked about um, in high school. We talk about it a lot in general biology, and that's really where you need one dominant trait one dominant allele, and this particular trait will appear in your phenotype, right? This is not the only pattern of inheritance, right? There is also incomplete dominance, right? And this would be where you actually kind of get a blending of both. So in this situation, right, the heterozygote, instead of just showing that dominant trait, we actually see a blend. So this would be like if this was a red flower and this allele was for a white flower, in complete dominance, right, if we do the same thing, red and white, an individual heterozygote, heterozygous for this trait, they have one copy of the dominant, so what shows up? red shows up in their phenotype, right? In incomplete dominance, which some traits in the human body follow, this is going to give us a pink outcome, right? And just to make it even more confusing, right, there are some traits that follow a different pattern called codominance. And codominance means that both traits can show up. So this would be um, kind of the classic, I suppose, example here would be blood type, right? So um, type A blood is a dominant trait. Type B blood is also a dominant trait. And instead of getting pink, what do you get? You get both A's and B's on the outside of that red blood cell, right? So you get type AB blood. Okay, so what I want you to realize, right, is this is what we spend a lot of time talking about, right? Mendel and his peas talk a lot about um, complete dominance. There definitely are other patterns um, of inheritance. And in fact, I will say, probably the biggest mistake that we make is because Mendel and his peas, every, study that he did was really looking at a single gene, a single trait, right? What color are the flowers? What color are the seeds? Are they wrinkly? What's, how tall is the plant, right? We tend to think that way a lot. Um, but a lot of inheritance is actually what we call polygenic. So this is all basically like single gene. And a lot of inheritance is actually polygenic. Poly meaning many, many genes influencing it. So classic eye color, right? I often do this as complete dominance. I say, okay, brown eyes, blue eyes. I still might do this to you, um, right? But in fact, there are three different chromosomes that have genes that influence eye color, right? So it's just way more complicated than that. But a lot of things a lot of inheritance patterns in humans as well really can be understood with this kind of um, genetics. Now, phew. Okay. So hopefully then you're at least somewhat familiar with a Punnett square, right? These Punnett squares are super useful in figuring out inheritance, particularly um, with that complete dominance, right? And so what we're looking at here is really trying to understand that if the egg has two copies of chromosome one, right? We know through meiosis only one of those actually ends up in the egg, right, from mom. But here are the two possibilities. Mom clearly was homozygous recessive. The only thing she was gonna pass on 
in this particular chromosome was a small a. Here we see the paternal alleles, right? So dad, he also needs to give a copy of chromosome one. If dad is homozygous dominant, when you go through meiosis, right, only one of those um, are gonna end up in the sperm, and we don't know which sperm is gonna fertilize which egg. So this Punnett square really helps us work out probability, right? So I bring each of these into a square, and we can see here, um, that in the offspring, right, all of them are going to end up heterozygous, right? And in this particular case, what are they giving us here? Um, big A is normal pigmentation. It looks like little a is some kind of abnormal um, pigmentation, right? All of these end up heterozygous, one copy of the dominant um, normal skin pigmentation, right? But they do the exact same thing here, but with dad as a heterozygote. So his phenotype, since he has a dominant allele, his phenotype looks like completely normal pigmentation, but as a carrier of that recessive allele, so carrier is the term used when an individual is heterozygous, and particularly if that recessive allele is for some sort of disease state. And so now we do that exact same Punnett square, right? And we see that half of the children are homozygous recessive and they're, oh, it's for albinism, right? Half of them then are going to be albino. Now, one thing to keep in mind, a couple things to keep in mind. When you do a Punnett square, right, and it tells you probability, you have to, have to, have to remember that each additional offspring is like another roll of the dice, right? Just because you rolled one on the first time doesn't make it impossible to roll one the next time, right? So even here when you're saying it's 50-50, you could easily have this set up and have five children with normal pigmentation, right? Or five albino children. Each time, each offspring, it's a 50-50 chance, right? We all know that family that has like five boys and you're like, how does that even happen, right? It's a 50-50 chance. Okay, so this is, oh sorry, I told you other things um, I was going to tell you. A couple other things um, to keep in mind, right? When we talk about, we'll come back to that, let's do sex linked. So in a sex linked inheritance, we are only dealing with chromosome number 23, right? And chromosome number 23 is the X and the Y. Now, the Y chromosome is really small, right? Notice how much smaller the Y is than the X, and it really only has a couple genes. The genes on the Y chromosome are specific for things like how to develop the male um, anatomy and physiology, right? How to make testosterone and things um, like that. There can't be anything essential on that Y chromosome because females don't have it. Right? So it's only the instructions essentially for how to be male. So when we look at sex-linked disease and how that might be inherited, I know this sounds confusing, but it's really things that are on the X chromosome. Right? Now this pattern of inheritance is a little different. Right? Every ovum is going to give an X chromosome to the offspring. Because right? if you looked at mom, Right? The reason she's mom is because she is XX, right? She's female. Dad is XY. So he either gives the X chromosome or he gives the Y chromosome. Now here's the thing. With sex-linked disorders, they show up much more often in males, right? Because what happens is a male who is XY, he only has one copy of the X chromosome. So there's no way to hide if there is a bad version of the gene, right? Okay, C is a terrible letter, right? But they're trying to do a capital and a lowercase, right? So if this lowercase C is um, from a disease state, right? This is doing color vision, right? Mom is totally, has normal vision, but she's a carrier for that. But look what happens in her sons. They only inherit a Y from dad, so the X chromosome has to come from mom. A mom who's a carrier is going to give that sex link trait to her son. The only way for a female to end up with that um, 
with a sex-linked disease is if dad had the disease and mom also had the disease. So they're not showing that here, but if dad is in fact colorblind, right, if he had a lower case C and mom has a lower case C, then you could have half your daughters actually be colorblind, but it's much more rare, right? This is not a common, um, necessarily a common trait. Okay, so what they're showing you here, right, is the two possible um, ova, right? This one has a capital C, this woman is a carrier for colorblindness, so a lowercase c. Dad has normal color vision, right? So all daughters are gonna have normal color vision. Half the daughters get two big C's, totally normal, not carrying, inheriting that trait. Um, half the daughters then will be a carrier, but also have normal vision, right? Um, half the males get normal vision because they inherited the dominant normal vision allele from mom, X chrom or Y chromosome from dad, and then half of the boys will be colorblind, right? So sex-linked inheritance works a little differently, um, but there are some important diseases um, that work this way as well. Okay, so we'll try a couple Punnett squares in class, um, but hopefully that's not too um, foreign to you. Now, a couple other things I do want to point out, because I do think this might come up, um, is keeping in mind that when we talk about, I think this comes up a lot in things like we have um, screening for certain genes, say like cancer genes, right? So the really common one maybe you've heard of um, is the breast cancer, BRCA1, right? In fact, I think this is the one Angelina Jolie um, tested positive for, that she had this gene to have breast cancer, and so she preemptively went ahead um, and had a mastectomy. Now, here's the thing. Just because you inherit BRCA1, right, in fact, even two copies of BRCA1, doesn't mean you're going to get breast cancer, right? So different genes have different what we call penetrance. So penetrance is the percent of individuals who inherit the gene that then express the gene. Right? And so in something like colorblindness that we were just talking about, I think it's like 100%, right? If you have those genes, right, you, you have colorblindness. But think about something like breast cancer, right? Sure, there are mutations, right? And if you think back to um, cancer, wow, that might be gen bio as well. You have, do you guys remember oncogenes that tell cells to undergo mitosis? and then tumor suppressor genes that tell them to slow down on mitosis, right? You actually have to have multiple mutations in order for this cancer to actually end up coming around. So we have other things that play a role here. Things like environment um, also make a difference, right? How do you accumulate more of these mutations in order, right, for this breast cancer to go up? So um, a lot of these genetic diseases that maybe people are getting tested for later in life realize that just because you have the gene doesn't mean you're gonna have the disease. It's useful to look at the, um, the penetrance as well, right? Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing I wanted to say there. Um, okay, so just a real brief look um, at inheritance, um, but let me know in class if you have questions, we can run through some examples but you should be com getting comfortable um, with this terminology.